Hello, and welcome to the Space Systems Florida Tech Alumni Panel. My name is Stephanie Bacon, and I am the AVP for Alumni Affairs and Giving. And our co-moderators for tonight's evening is Dr. Don Platt. He's the director of the Florida Tech Spaceport Education Center next to the Kennedy Space Center, and Jillian LeClaire, who's moderating from Facebook Live. The excitement of Facebook, SpaceX, Falcon 9, and Crew Dragon spacecraft takeoffs from the Kennedy Space Center has absolutely ignited public interest in the industry. Tonight, we're fortunate to have a wide array of experience from different areas of the space industry on this alumni panel. The flow for tonight's evening is as follows. I will briefly introduce our three alumni panelists. Each panelist will take a few minutes sharing their current work experience. This will be followed by a few general questions any of the panelists can answer. In fact, we already have a couple of questions which came in by email. Thank you to Emmanuel Brown. Everyone, please use the chat function on the bottom of the screen. It's the bubble in the center of the bottom, and you can type your questions right in. Don or I will contact you and encourage you to ask the questions yourself. For those of you on Facebook Live, feel free to type in your questions and we'll ask them for you. Everyone will remain on mute during the presentation portion of the meeting. Let's begin. Allow me to introduce Dave Borzillo. Dave is the Agile Business Transformation Lead for Pratt & Whitney. Dave has worked for over two decades to help teams improve the way they work and optimize for performance. Currently in his role with Pratt & Whitney, he is helping GatorWorks focus on the rapid and agile development of dependable, low-cost, state-of-the-art military engines in half the time and half the cost of traditional procurement cycles. And he promised that he was gonna explain exactly what GatorWorks is. Now allow me to introduce our next alum, Sharif Abdel Mahid. He's a test director at NASA Kennedy Space Center. Sharif earned both his bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and master's degree in space systems management at Florida Tech. His space systems management experience spans more than a decade. Sharif serves in a leadership role in, in the firing room, isn't that called firing room, for the integrated verification and validation, multi-element verification and validation operations of the ground systems. He also leads the integrated testing of the space launch system and Orion flight and ground hardware. He also does the launch countdown for the multi-purpose crew vehicle and cargo missions. I'm a little jealous about the launch countdown part. And finally, Andy Sokol. He's a vehicle systems engineer with NASA Kennedy Space Center. Andy also earned both his degrees from Florida Tech in aerospace engineering and space systems. His 17 year career history includes work on small aircraft, the space shuttle, the space launch system, and various rocket fleets utilized by NASA's launch service program. He has worked in spacecraft, subsystem operations and processing, vehicle, manufacturing, risk management, and overall launch vehicle systems. Andy currently serves as a vehicle systems engineer for the Atlas V rocket in support of NASA science missions, including the recent Solar Orbiter and upcoming Mars 2020. And with that, Dave, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dave Borzol. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for um, allowing me to, to be on this panel with, with these other fantastic folks and tell a little bit about the program and myself. Um, my uh, bachelor's degree is in mechanical engineering. I went to Rose Holman Institute of Technology in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, and I, I participated in the program at Florida Tech for space systems. I graduated in 2010. So as uh, Stephanie mentioned, um, I work for Pratt & Whitney. Uh, we do jet engines and the RD-1 180 engine program. That's our only rocket program we have uh, right now. And I work for uh, a team inside of uh, Pratt & Whitney in West Palm Beach called GatorWorks. So for you aviation fans, it kind of pays homage to Skunk Works, where a lot of the great military aircraft uh, came out of. The Gator part is because we're located west of West Palm Beach, far enough west where we're kind of on the edge of the swamp. So there are gators in the retention pond near the parking lot. And that's kind of like out on the way to the test stands for both the jet engines and, and the rocket test stands in Western Palm Beach County. So it's a lot of fun. Um, so basically GataWorks, you know, we basically have three, three main rules, right? 
use everything in, in, in your in the intellectual property disposal. Uh, don't break any laws and don't kill anyone. So we're on the forefront of developing uh, new propulsion technology for various clients. So NASA is one of our clients. Uh, U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory is another one. And of course, we work with uh, main uh, uh, primes like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, etc. So the job's a lot of fun. Uh, really enjoy it. And, you know, the the, the degree was definitely um, a key part in, in what I'm doing today. So I uh, just want to share with you a quick story, right? Some of the doors that get open because of the program. I have here a textbook, one of my favorite classes. I'm sure the panelists uh, will recognize it, right? So you get to take a propulsion class. So um, the program is very flexible. At the time, I was working for DirecTV, and I was flying back. Their headquarters is in Los Angeles, so I was taking a nonstop flight back to Miami since I kind of lived near that airport as well. So I had this textbook uh, open up on the on my seat. I was trying to get some homework done. It's a five hour flight. And uh, I, 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 so all of a sudden I get this tap on my shoulder behind me and and the person says, excuse me, are you a rocket scientist? I said, well, I'm studying to be one. And well, I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a Hollywood producer working on a new series. I kind of have some questions about, you know, how rockets work and what's possible and what's not. So. He was working on this new series. You've never heard of it because it never became reality. But you know, one day, let's say Jeff Bezos and all these guys decide to, and Elon Musk decide to use their money to mine, you know, helium three from the moon because there's an energy shortage, right? So, had a great exchange. Basically, what I'm learning and helping out, you know, this producer in Hollywood. Um, I was also, you know, working on studying the uh, space industry in general and at, at, at the time of my program. And I was able to connect with Gwen Shotwell of SpaceX. Many of you know her um, uh, and, and basically had a great time just doing email interviews with you. She was really great about getting back to me and you know, answering my questions about, you know, what, you know, from what you can tell me, how does this work? How does that work at SpaceX? So, um, you know, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, and you guys have questions, I'll be happy to answer them later. Thanks. Thank you so much. And Sharif. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Stephanie and uh, Don, for, uh, for setting this up. Um, always happy to talk about what we do at the space program. And uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I uh, started uh, my undergrad at Florida Institute of Technology uh, with aerospace engineering and found myself uh, working as a contractor as an intern and doing co-ops um, starting my sophomore year and throughout that process I jumped from company to company started working for the ground systems on the space shuttle did everything from labeling to relief valve calculations then uh, after a year of doing that I found myself on the Air Force side of the Cape where I worked on the Delta II program the pad, pad activation for the Delta IV program, worked the Atlas V, and I got a little nice little tribute back here for the Atlas V that uh, I know Andy will appreciate this one. This was the, uh, this one launched in 2011 with the uh, Curiosity rover, and we're getting ready to launch uh, another Atlas V uh, July 20th, and this 541 configuration, meaning it's got four SRVs and a five meter uh, fairing on uh, July 20th with the Perseverance rover. So here we are almost 10 years later launching another rover to Mars. Um, so I spent a lot of time working for the Air Force over there uh, as a contractor, jumped from uh, job to job there, gaining experience until I finished my uh, undergrad degree. And then I got my uh, first real full-time job working on a uh, on umbilical testing. Anything that connects to the rocket we refer to as an umbilical. And I spent a long campaign, uh, five years, testing all the umbilicals for the new space launch system. And through that process of being a test conductor and working on developing procedures and executing tests, uh, it's when I decided to go and get my master's degree at uh, FIT. And I was lucky to convince the company I was working for, Cyril Lobo at the time, to pay for it, which is you know, always a good thing. And I was able to take all these classes and FIT being flexible and being online, it was a great opportunity. And then with that opportunity, I slingshotted my way uh, to become a test director. Now I work on, uh, now my main focus is the Artemis One program. I work in the uh, Launch Control Center where our main focus is getting the, uh, all the ground systems, mobile launcher, Pad 39B, everything ready to support the first uh, space launch system launch, which is currently scheduled for uh, end of 2021 at this time. 
So the whole rocket's been built. Uh, I work with a, a great group with uh, supporting. Our group is actually the uh, launch uh, and recovery. Uh, we test, we launch, and we recover. So we're responsible for getting the rocket off the pad. And, um, uh, and after it splashes down off the coast of San Diego, we work with the DOD and the Navy uh, to recover the ship. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking with the group. Looks like we have a great crowd and uh, uh, happy to speak on, on behalf of the uh, Artemis One program. So back to you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Rich. And although I love your frame, Andy definitely has, he's the winner for the best background. Andy? Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, Don, thank you as well for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, my name is Andy Sokol, and I was in love with space and the space shuttle ever since I was old enough to be in love with anything. So today I'm a vehicle systems engineer in NASA's Launch Services Program. The Launch Services Program is responsible for launching scientific missions to observe the Earth or uh, interplanetary missions or explore the universe, telescopes, and you name it. Um, but I'm going to roll it back a little bit. I'm going to kind of walk you through my career so that I can tell you about how that love that I had as a kid and Florida Tech has helped me along the way. So when I decided that uh, I was going to go to college, I knew I had to come down to Florida because this is where the action is, right? We're, we're launching rockets. We're launching the space shuttle down here. So this is where I needed to be. And I also wanted to go to a relatively small school. I didn't want to go to those big city side schools and get lost in the crowd, you know. So Florida Tech really fit the bill for me. So I enrolled in the aerospace engineering program. And a couple of years later, I led a team of students through a capstone project, which was a homebrew sounding rocket that we launched to about 81,000 feet. It was awesome. Uh, and a couple of months later, I graduated. And a few months after that, I was hired by United Space Alliance as an orbiter structures engineer on the space shuttle program. Um, I did that for nine years. I worked a total of 22 space shuttle missions and also supported the Ares 1X, um, the attempted startup of the Constellation program, and the transition and retirement of the space shuttle. Um, during that time, I earned a uh, Silver Snoopy Award, which is the Astronauts Personal Achievement Award. It's kind of ironic because I'm a hardware guy, and yet I wrote some software to help uh, analyze the photos the crews would send down from orbit uh, when they were inspecting the wing leading edge. So I wrote some software to streamline that process and uh, received this uh, really amazing award. Um, during that time as well, I wanted to, you know, try to advance my career. And I had been kind of lusting after this space systems degree that Florida Tech had for quite a long time. I, it sounded really interesting. And I had actually taken the intro course as an elective when I was an undergraduate to, to get a, a taste of it. So, um, so during my time with United Space Alliance, I went back and took the courses on the side and wrapped up that master's program in 2009. Now, when we were wrapping up transition and retirement of the space shuttle, um, I got picked up by Piper Aircraft down in Vero Beach. So I went down there and was working as a liaison engineer supporting the assembly line, the manufacturing and assembly and flight testing of these brand new aircraft. Very cool job, really enjoyed it, really enjoyed the people, but as you can probably tell, my heart was still in the space program, so I had to come back. So three years later, I was hired by Jacobs Technology on the test and operations support contract, which is the uh, ground processing contract for the upcoming space launch system uh, that NASA is going to be using in the Artemis program to launch our astronauts back to the moon. While I was doing that, I was responsible for development of requirements and insight into project management and contract health and also risk management. Um, I had a really promising path there and I really enjoyed it. And again, the people were great. But uh, three years later, I had a, uh, an amazing offer that I couldn't pass up. I was uh, offered a position as a vehicle systems engineer for NASA directly in the launch services program. So this was really thrilling. Not only could I work for NASA, but now I could really utilize that master's degree that I had earned. So in a nutshell, the uh, vehicle systems engineer is part of the team that will help pair up a science mission with the appropriate rocket to launch it on. LSP has a, an array of different rockets we can choose from. And so we have to find which one is the right one. And once we choose that, rocket for that mission. Then we have insight into the build and manufacturing and assembly and transport and processing and stacking and launch of that rocket for that mission. Now, during all that, sometimes issues might come up or maybe there's modifications or design changes. So the vehicle systems engineer has to understand what these changes are going to be or what these issues are and bring all the right people to the table, bring all the subsystem engineers that know those specific systems and bring everybody to the table to make sure we can work it out right. You know, subsystem A, their resolution for an issue might adversely affect subsystem B. So we got to make sure everyone's there working it out. Um, so, you know, the vehicle systems engineer maintains that higher level 
overall systems thinking to, to work it out. Now come launch time, the VSE becomes the assistant chief engineer. So we sit right by the chief engineer and during launch countdown, should an issue arise, same situation, we identify the right team to go work that issue. I send them off with the chief engineer and then I'll hang back and monitor the countdown with the remainder of the team to make sure everything else is going fairly smoothly. So the space systems degree is absolutely perfect for this job because you kind of have to be a jack of all subsystems, if you will. You know, they, the space systems courses were kind of like a primer for each subsystem, whether it was launch vehicles, subsystem one, two, three, or the spacecraft or mission design. So you got a little bit of everything. So then now I can speak all the different languages of all these subsystems and yet still see the bigger picture. So it's been really exciting so far. I've been processing multiple missions in parallel. As Stephanie mentioned, I worked um, on the Atlas V primarily. So worked a solar orbiter mission a couple months ago. We've got Mars 2020 coming up next month. Uh, by the way, there's a launch briefing tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, so recommend you guys tune in for that. So it's been super exciting. been loving the job. On the personal side, as you can hear, I've been really, really busy over my career, but I've still been happy that I can maintain a stable home life with my wonderful wife and two kids. I can use the artistic half of my brain with uh, my photography hobby, which I turned into a moderately successful side business. And then, of course, uh, as Stephanie loves to point out, um, to engage my engineering at home. I like to revive and refurbish these old pinball machines that you see behind me there. And of course, play them as much as I can as well. So, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. I was gonna, we were gonna do a poll and ask everyone if that was a real background or if that was one of those manufacturers backgrounds. So that would have been a fun <laughs> poll for tonight. Um, so we're gonna kick off the question portion. Thank you alumni panel, panelists for sharing all of your insight into what you're currently doing and a little bit of um, an idea of what your days are like. We're gonna start off with the email first from Emmanuel Brown, class of 2004. Um, he asks, with SpaceX, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, NASA, and others all vying for space in space, do you think there's enough room for everyone or will one of the companies have to step aside thinking commercial, military, NASA, personal, and exploratory payloads. And then of course he has another follow-up question to this. How do you think the space industry is faring during the COVID-19 shutdowns and what will it look like post COVID-19 and when? Pretty loaded questions. Who would like to go first? All right, I'll jump in there. Um, so as far as, as far as NASA is concerned, I mean, you know, we want everybody to play, you know, they, in launch services programs, since we have, we already have a stable of a number of different launch vehicles that we can choose from. And if we have more players, more horses in that stable, then that just helps us optimize for any given mission. Hey, look at all these extra choices that we have. We can pick the best rocket for the job because there's more variety. Um, second part of the question, as far as COVID is concerned, I think we've really learned that we can work really well from afar. I think that surprised a lot of people, especially, uh, you know, with the remote system that we can tie in and have meetings together. So, um, you know, we've been keeping an eye on if there's been anything affected, but as you can see, we're still launching. You know, SpaceX had a, their commercial crew launch a couple uh, weeks ago. We've got March 2020 coming up. Everything seems to be going great there. So it doesn't seem like it's adversely affected us too much. On the positive side, I think that when we get back to work, um, when we're all back in the office, I think we're going to find that there are going to be a lot fewer people that come to work sick anymore because now we all see that we can work from home and still be successful so hopefully people won't be bringing germs to the office anymore. Would anybody else like to, to um, answer the question? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, I can, add, I can add to that. Great. Um, you know, Kennedy Space Center is a multi-user spaceport. That's the big transition we've done since the conclusion of the shuttle to today. Uh, we rely on our partners. We rely on our commercial crew program to get cargo to the space station, to launch our astronauts to space now. And speaking in the, from a launch control center perspective, I mean, we have SpaceX using our, one of our firing rooms. They're using one of our launch pads. Boeing is in an old orbiter processing facility doing their CST-100 and the X-37 space plane. North of Grumman's building the Omega rocket and they're gonna be using our vehicle assembly building. So we have more than enough room and we're looking to build on that, especially with uh, the next frontier of going back to the moon, going to Mars, doing this, uh, you know, one team is not going to be possible. We need the commercial partners to be able to resupply, to be able to keep that chain going back and forth, whether it's the moon, the gateway, the space station. So 
as of right now, uh, the more the merrier. We definitely do not want anybody stepping aside, and we're encouraging that, and we're investing a lot of money into that. Uh, for COVID-19, I actually am uh, on the team uh, for the COVID-19 uh, emergency coordinator uh, as part of a, being a NASA test director. We handle, we're, we handle the COVID response. We handle any hurricane response. We have to protect our assets. And uh, we've been able to maintain our launches. Uh, being able to launch those two, uh, Doug and Bob, on the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket is a testament of what we were able to accomplish uh, being under these, these restrictions, having people work from home. It's a true testament of the skill and the talent that comes uh, with working for the police program. So it's uh, it's it's been it's been great what we've been able to do. And you know, when we're all smart, you got to be smart to work at the space center, and you have to have some common sense. And applying that, uh, we we've, we've had close to zero cases, only a handful that really didn't affect anyone. So uh, we keep charging forward and we keep launching. Excellent. Thank you so much. We do have quite a few questions in the chat box right now. Um, Larry Pollock has asked me to ask on his behalf, so I'll go ahead and do that. With the evolving and growing commercial launch vehicle industry, do you anticipate a near-term shortage of qualified aerospace engineers, AKA Rocket Man? Andy, tell us a little bit about the pinball machine collection behind you. Sorry, that was a little bit of an aside. <laughs> Okay, so I guess uh, we'll start with the pinball machine collection real quick because that's the that's the, the fun answer. Um, yeah, so I I had a pinball machine in my house growing up. It was my dad's favorite game, so he had picked it up in the 1970s and kept it there. So um, I was always into pinball, and any chance I had to play when I was at an arcade or a campground or anywhere, I was always always playing it whenever I could. So uh, as I got older and got settled in and um, got a home. Uh, my wife and I decided, hey, you know, this would be a fun place to start having a, a few pinball machines. So I kind of got into the habit of finding them when I could and learning how to fix them. You know, again, using that engineering side to fix them up and get them running again. And then since then, I could just trade them out or sell them and get new ones whenever I can. So it's, it's just a blast. It's a fun hobby to work on and uh, get my kids involved, too. They help me repair them. But, you know, the simple tasks when they can. So uh, as you can see, Space Shuttle back there is one of my favorites been collecting astronaut autographs on the decorative plastics. Can't see them from this far away, but uh, a benefit of working at the Space Center is the astronauts come through. So I, when I hear about it, I bring my piece and get a nice autograph on there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Don, do you have a question in the chat box that you would uh, like yes. to Yes. Uh, Michelle Boschman would like to ask the group, uh, being in quality control and biotech, I'm aware of the importance of all the math and data verification. What type of verification is performed for the steps to successfully launch a rocket? Hey, Don, can you repeat that second part again? Yes, Michelle is interested in what are the steps for verification that are needed to successfully launch a rocket? Yes, I can, uh, I can touch base on that. And uh, just to, and just go back real quick to that previous question. I mean, rocket science. Uh, there's so much demand for jobs. I mean, we're losing people to SpaceX and Blue Origin every day as these companies grow. So you're definitely safe going into this industry. And then, uh, in regards to uh, you know quality perspective verification validation for uh, for rocket launch, it is it's very thorough. Our quality people go through every little piece of everything we do. And it's always a back and forth battle between, uh, hey, let's get this done. And hey, no, we need to verify and triple check everything. Um, just uh, using the demo two mission with launching Bob and Doug. I mean, we didn't just triple check, we quadruple checked every little thing to make sure everything was perfect. Every sensor, every zero, every one, everything. So. And uh, on the subject of double checking, so in launch services program, you know, we rely on the launch vehicle providers, which are, you know, some of these other private companies that build the rockets, but we have insight into the work that they do. And so if they have an issue that they are going to resolve or if they have a design change they're going to work in, you know, we bring our subsystem engineers in to do their own independent analysis of what they're working on so that, yes, we can look at their analysis that the launch vehicle provider has done, but we're going to do our own independent check to make sure that we agree with what they're, what they're doing to the launch vehicle to make sure that we succeed in our missions as well.
And we have a, our, one of our first questions is from Vicki. Vicki, would you like to ask your question in person? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, guys, for people who are interested in pursuing degrees in space systems, can you give us an idea of what the time commitment is as far as how long it takes you to study on a weekly basis? What's the overall time frame? You know, can you complete the degree in a year, two years? Uh, is it better to take five years, whatever it might be? Okay, so uh, I, I think when I started taking it, I believe it was intended to be a two-year program. I ended up doing about three and a half, um, one to help manage the workload because I didn't want to overload myself. And also because um, at the time I was with the United Space Alliance and they had a cap on how much educational reimbursement they would do. So I kind of strategically planned it out so that I could make sure that all the bills were paid by my employer, which was really nice, um, and yet still finish in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, it took me about, fact, think, it took me about uh, two years as well. Um, I was actually living about, it was a 90 minute drive away from the education center. So I had, you know, an hour and a half round trip. Uh, and, the, and basically if I took two classes, it would be the same night or sometimes I'd have to drive up twice. But uh, yeah, it was also about two years, you know, again, some semesters, um, you know, if you could take one class, you could spread it out that way. But there's kind of like a sequence, at least when I was taking it. So it was kind of like, you know, once you get in a cohort with other classmates, you kind of you know, like to be in the same classes because you, because in the end for the capstone course, you know, you're kind of teaming up also. So you kind of, uh, you know, want to learn from your fellow classmates who you can group up with. Uh, so it kind of helps and, and you're building relationships that way too. But, um, you know, it's a, you know, a good few hours a week for each class you're going to take for sure. Uh, and then, you know, if classes have final projects or whatever, that's going to be something you want to take into consideration. But I was traveling, uh, like I mentioned earlier as well, and there were one or two sessions where I basically Skyped in because this is, was about 10 years ago, right? So I could do that. So um, yeah, it was basically flexible to figure out how to get it to work. Yeah, like Dave was saying, you know, you got to take into consideration, at least then there was uh, travel time to and from your classes because we weren't uh, in this quite as virtual environment as we are now. You know, at the time that I took it, we had classes on Patrick Air Force Base and then some at Kennedy Space Center and some at uh, another building in Rockledge. And so we were all over the place where from what I understand now, I think there's a lot more uh, virtual access to it. So that could help with the, the time management aspect of it. But I do remember that when we first started, um, you know, again, you know, you're getting into a commitment because it's going to be a lot of work. I believe uh, some of the advice that some of the professors gave us was if you're married, don't get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, and, uh, and I can uh, sh shed some light. So for me, um, um, you know, the great thing is like everybody who's doing their master's degree is usually working at the Space Center or has some kind of job and has a family. So the stress level isn't as high as being an undergraduate. And something that I advise anybody who's uh, a contractor, I went up to my contractor and I was like, hey, look, you know, you got 80 people working out here. No one's taking advantage of the uh, reimbursement for uh, higher education. Um, and essentially I convinced them um, to essentially give me a blank check. I got mine done in a year and a half. and and because I wanted to make sure I got it done before they changed their mind. Um, but if you're not a civil servant, go to your contractor and ask them, you know, only things they're going to say no, because every company has like, you know, a cap, they can only give you 5,000 a semester a year, but you can always ask for more. And if they have a big workforce and no one's using that benefit, there's no reason why they can't give you more money. So you got to negotiate that. You got to always kind of work every angle. And I essentially was able to get that blank check and I just ran with it. I was taking three classes a semester. Yes, you got to dedicate a few hours a week each time. Uh, with you know professors like Dr. Platt and, and Mitchell and people with real world experience understand what it's like to have a full time job and go to school. It was a it was excellent and that onlineness. That was the first time I did I did classes that were completely online for the first time. And now when I do all these virtual meetings, that's a piece of cake because of that. So that's a great question. Great. So Stephen Finker has a question, and that is, what is the next step after the SpaceX Demo Two launch? Will NASA continue its partnership of launching to ISS using Dragon or revert back to the Soyuz? Also, will SpaceX be involved with the Artemis and will NASA fund SpaceX plans for Mars missions? Ooh, some, some loaded topics there, guys. 
All right. So uh, a couple of things I can throw out there with that. So, um, yeah, of course, the intent is to not have to go back to the Soyuz. We want to continue that commercial crew program here at home. So, um, you know, SpaceX will continue supporting that. And then uh, Boeing and ULA are also supporting that. Boeing has their uh, CST-100 capsule that they've been working on as well. Um, as far as uh, SpaceX involvement with Artemis, um, I don't believe they have any involvement directly with, um, with SLS. But I do believe that uh, they were getting pulled into part of the Gateway program. Um, I don't I don't remember specifically which components they might get involved with, but uh, I think they're going to try to get involved over there as well. Yeah, to, I can add to what Andrew just said. So yeah, so SpaceX has been awarded or hopes to award uh, a resupply for the Gateway. And um, as of now, they're not uh, you know collaborating on SLS, but we do see potential partnership with all commercial entities on that. Now, first with, D, with DM2, the demo mission with the astronauts, it's not done yet. The astronauts still have to come back. So assuming all that is successful, that's going to continue. And we plan on launching four more people on that capsule uh, by the end of this year. And hopefully once Boeing does their demonstration autonomously, they'll be launching two astronauts uh, of their own soon. And so the, the partnerships are going to continue to grow. And uh, we're definitely, uh, it's, it's definitely exciting. Hopefully uh, no more Soyuz. Uh, hopefully we say we're done with that. Excellent. Joel, did you want to ask your question or would you like me to ask your question for you? If you would like to ask your question, you just can unmute. Give him a moment. All right, I'm going to go ahead and ask his question for him. I have a degree in computer information systems. What could I do in the space program? Dave, I wish you know, I were a software guy. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, yeah, I have an IT background. So especially at the time I was working for DirecTV. Uh, so, in, you know, uh, with, with Dr. Platt, uh, you know, we even worked on a project to program, I think it was United Nations, UNESCO's first little CubeSat, right? Yeah. So especially in this CubeSat um, environment that, that Dr. Platt is one of the pioneers of, um, you know, there's, you know, and, and basically, you know, buy an Arduino and 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 try to think about what type of payload you want to put in it and program it. And who knows with things going the way it is, you know, you maybe not have to work for anybody. You could basically hitch a ride on on some of these rockets we've been talking about and get your CubeSat in orbit. So 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 there's a huge commercial opportunity right there in CubeSats. And you know, if you can write software, um, you know, Java or whatever language, you can basically program a CubeSat and then get it get it up there today more than ever, it's you're, you're closer to actually making something happen privately. And especially with these uh, commercial groups coming up with uh, these new vehicles and, you know, the software that they have to put together to get their firing room working. I um, mean, you know, I have some colleagues that have been working with firing room software for SLS because, you know, you think about it, you have all these requirements and, and red lines and concerns that you have to be watching for during launch. And a lot of that gets automated. So if you are, a programmer, you know, you can write the software to say, hey, you know, this flag gets tripped. Well, we need to, you know, hold the launch or reset the countdown or whatever. So, yeah, definitely opportunities. Excellent. We have our next question from Yanova. Would you like to ask your question live? Hi, yes, I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, let me just pull it up because I know I had a, a couple. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that you had <laughs> at least two. All right. So my two questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for talking with us today. Um, this has been great. I think everyone's really benefited from the information that you guys has, have shared. So thank you for that. Um, and additionally, my questions are, did you find it challenging to juggle a full-time job with this master's program? I know a lot of you guys had, I'm assuming, um, or you spoke about having jobs within the aerospace industry, and I know those jobs can be pretty um, time consuming and challenging on their own. So I was hoping you could touch on any challenges you face with juggling both. And a, the second part of that question, um, for those who are able to do the program virtually, uh, were you able to successfully communicate and network with not only your professors, but also your classmates through the virtual program? And I can repeat those if you need be. 
So, you know, the, the uh, work life balance, right? I mean, look, it's going to be an investment for sure. Right. But it's something where, you know, this subject matter, this program, you know, it's all about understanding space systems. So, you know, it, and to be honest, you know, I actually started my MBA and then I got tired of writing papers every semester of how Microsoft is or is not a monopoly. Right. So mm -hmm. after halfway through that, I put that aside. I'm like, what am I really interested in? And it's really spacecraft design, spacecraft systems or anything aerospace. So, you know, yes, you know, especially if you're taking two classes a semester, you know, you got to set the time aside. But I mean, I don't think there was a, a, a boring class in the entire, you know, curriculum for the program. Everyone was interesting in their own way. Um, and, and, you know, it, if that's your passion is, is, is to, to, to deal with space exploration in general, you know, we get on a lot of great discussions, right? Like, you know, human space, space flight versus robotic space flight. Why do we have to launch people into space, right? Uh, you know, when, where there's people, there's politics. And, 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 and we get into those discussions as well as, you know, the, the basic subsystems about how a space, um, spacecraft is going to navigate to, you know, in its mission and its profile and astrodynamics and the whole thing. So, you know, if those are the things that interest you, it's going to help propel you through the program. Yeah, and to add to that work-life balance, I mean, there were many times where, you know, my boss walked into my cube and I was not working on my job. I was doing my homework or preparing for a final day later that day. Um, but, you know, based on the environment, it just, it just, it just all it comes down to balance. And, uh, you know, the, the curriculum, I did the space systems management, and I actually ended up really enjoying the management side of things because then when I go back to work, I can really understand why we do certain contracts a certain way or, you know, the things the things are set up, the financial side of things, the accounting, the, the government contract side of things. So definitely um, that insight was really big. So, you know, being an engineer, but being an engineer that can do contracts and finances can be a, uh, can be a dangerous thing in the space program. So. And just to add to what these guys have said so far, um, you know, I, my wife was very understanding about the time requirement that I was going to need. Uh, we didn't have kids yet at the time. Uh, that was in the plans, but, you know, we said, all right, let me wrap up this master's degree real quick and <laughs> then, we'll, then we'll go from there. But uh, she was really understanding about it because she knew how important it was for, for my career to, to get that done. Um, as far as the other part of your question, uh, virtual, you know, at the time that I took it, it was almost exclusively in-person classes. Um, so I can't really speak to that. One more thing I did want to add is actually just um, like what Sharif said earlier, you know, the professors in the program, they have real jobs. They know what it's like as well. So, you know, they're very understanding that if you're struggling with the time management, you know, they'll be more than happy to do their best to accommodate whatever needs you have. So. Great. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from Vinny. Vinny, would you like to ask your question live? Yeah, sure. I'll ask. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was just uh, curious about the um, the different degrees, if they're designed more for uh, engineers to further their education and career, or like like personally, like myself, I come from a technician background, a corporate jet AMP for like 10 years, and then I spent about three years as a tech at SpaceX, and uh, I just finished my aviation management degree, and I was wanting to probably try to pivot back into the space industry. So I wasn't sure if these are designed more for engineers or if someone with a you know, technician background could, could use them to kind of further a career. Well, I think having an engineering background really helped with that, um, especially when there were some classes that were a little bit more uh, math heavy. So there were calculations involved and, and whatnot. So having that background definitely helped. I don't, I'm sure a, a technician would be able to excel as well. Uh, yeah, to, to add to that, uh, it really depends on the class. Like I remember orbital mechanics uh, with Professor Mitchell and that was, I mean, that was a nightmare. There was a lot of programming, a lot of calculations. Um, I mean, that was, there's some class of other ones, you know, like, uh, I won't say propulsion, but you know most of the other ones uh, definitely are doable, especially if you have real-world experience with space systems. 
that's that's applications you can directly apply to your class and have a good understanding of what's going on. Dave, do you have anything to add? Yep. Sorry, I thought you started talking, so I just wanted to make sure. Um, Lauren, you are up next. Would you like to ask your question? Okay, I'll take that as we will ask for you. Give me a second. The chat box is becoming quite long, so I just want to make sure I'm asking Lauren's question. This is from Lauren. Is it possible for a commercial pilot with an aviation management degree to become an astronaut? This might be a little bit out of your realm of expertise. Can you repeat that question one more time? Is it possible for a commercial pilot with an aviation management degree to become an astronaut? So I can actually speak to this just from personal experience. Um, my husband works for, for Southwest Airlines. Um, a famous astronaut named Hoot Gibson was an astronaut and then became a Southwest pilot. So I could imagine that maybe it could, that could flip, but don't quote me on that. I just, I know that from just experience. Anybody have anything else to add to that? I could answer that oh, a little bit yeah. myself. Oh, go I'm ahead, sorry, Andy. Did you? No, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, the key element is to have a diverse background as much as possible. So yeah, there's absolutely a number of astronauts who have uh, come at it from the, the realm of being pilots. Uh, a key element is to show that you're experienced in a number of areas. And I think that's one of the great things about the space systems program. And we have had a couple of astronauts that have come through the space systems program, by the way. Um, but it, it provides a very multidisciplinary background in space. So I think overall, it's a good path to, to go down to move in the direction of being an astronaut. Of course, it's very competitive to be an astronaut. And there are usually six or 7,000 applicants and maybe six or eight get selected. So it's not easy. Um, but yeah, this is certainly the space systems degree is a good way to move in that direction. And then another person is Captain Winston Scott, right? Our own uh, astronaut here at Florida Tech. He definitely was a pilot in several different aircraft. So that is another perfect example. Um, our next question is from Joshua. And Joshua asked that we ask his question, the question on his behalf. He is asking, what opportunities are there for those with commercialization enterprise in space degrees? How can one set themselves up to be successful in their career? Great question. Well, I mean, the one thing I can add that, you know, I'm experiencing now with Gatorworks is innovation, right? So, you know, if you go work for a company on the Space Coast or if you stick with aerospace, um, our customers, even the government customers, are asking for innovation, right? So they're asking for, we want the hot new technology, the hot new thing, make it better, faster, cheaper. So the mindset that you're going to learn with this degree is how, how can we innovate? How can we put the pieces together faster, better, cheaper to kind of deliver something that no one else has done before and kind of own the market in a sense and, and kind of capitalize on that? So and I guess, I guess my answer to the question is all around, you know, start getting in a mindset of innovation and then whether you want to do that for a SpaceX, a ULA, a NASA, or you can come to a Boeing or a Pratt & Whitney or a Lockheed, there's plenty of opportunity. Excellent. Does anybody have anything else to add? Our next question is from Fritz and he doesn't have a microphone. So we're going to ask for him. Uh, let's see. I just lost it. What would be a good subject to study to really prepare for working as a space engineer? I think what Fritz is asking is what would be a good bachelor's degree to, to start with? Well, I mean, I'm personally biased, but aerospace engineering was for me. I mean, Aerospace and mechanical were, uh, they kind of follow a, a similar course, but they really branch off and aerospace gets more into rocketry and um, engines, propulsion. And, um, you know, that was my field of interest, of course. So that's, that's the road that I took. But 
you know, we've seen engineers from all backgrounds, you know, all different majors come through and work for the various companies that are involved in the space program. So that's, you know, my advice for that is get the book for the programs that you're looking at and just read through the courses. That's kind of how I got towards the, the space systems degree because I, I had the program and I flipped through and I said, wow, these courses sound amazing. I want to take all these. So look through the different booklets for the different majors you want to consider and see which one just you naturally gravitate to. Excellent. And I'd like to add um, a lot of people, you know, having a technical degree, a degree, an engineering degree, you know, that's, you know, if you want to be a space engineer, absolutely. But keep in mind, you know, these management degrees, these business degrees, I mean, it takes, it's like a corporation out at the Space Center and any of these companies. It takes people on all different levels uh, to be able to make, uh, to make this happen. So anyone who's passionate about space, you don't have to be a, a super smart technical person. You can be really good with numbers or you can be really good with PR uh, and uh, get a job out uh, at the Space Center. And, you know, so getting those, you know, those, those uh, master's degrees and, and management of business is definitely useful in addition.